Good evening, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. We have a lot to talk about because, well, I haven't been here in the last month. Give you a quick update on that. A couple things I want to make sure we talk about. The first is the Chad Daybell trial. It is finally here, ladies and gentlemen, of everything that's taken place four years later. We've been talking four years. We've been talking about this case. Finally, the trial is going to uh, commence. We are in day two of the jury selection process. We'll talk about that and uh, what to expect. You know, the prosecutor has four attorneys over there, plus all their support staff, and it's just Chad Daybell and Mr. Pryor all there by himself, and of course, Brian Koberger. Let's talk, touch on what we want to talk about, Brian Koberger, okay? Everyone got their feathers all ruffled up when the prosecutors filed the motion to basically complaining, judge, 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 they're trying to influence the jurors, wah, wah, wah. And the judge didn't know what the hell was going on, so he said, basically, everybody stop doing whatever you're doing. Let's figure out what's going on. And of course, the prosecutor files a bunch of motions, had it sealed. The defense is like, are you kidding me? My client is on trial for capital murder, and you are interfering with my client's rights to uh, make sure he has a constitutionally uh, fair trial, which includes an unbiased jury. And therefore, uh, why are you interfering with this? So there's a hearing set for April 4th. There are a couple motions that were filed today, so we'll talk about that. Uh, we can also talk about the George Kelly trial, the case of the rancher, the 75-year-old rancher down there in Arizona who kills uh, the guy on his uh, property. So that is, um, I think, uh, going to be an interesting trial. I think we're on day six of that one today. Medical examiner uh, testified today. I think the defense attorney tried to get a little too cute uh, with some of her examples, it was a good, it was a good cross, uh, but I'm not sure she got out of it what she was uh, looking for. So um, let's get to it. First, everybody, thanks uh, for joining us. Um, oh, Uncivil Law is in the house. Uh, maybe we can have uh, uh, Frank uh, do that. Uh, we'll see. Maybe we can get Frank. He's just stepped out here a second. Um, all right. So first, where have I been? Where have I been? <laughs> uh, just got done, finished last Tuesday uh, doing a, a jury trial. It started March 4th. So it, it started, went, went into its fourth week. And it was a marathon. This would have been a five-week trial, uh, basically under any other judge. We had a judge. He's, she's a very good judge. I knew her when she was a uh, uh, an investigator, a prosecutor, and now she's a judge. Very, very fine uh, person, very good judge. Uh, no complaints. We got a fair trial. Uh, we came up in uh, uh, came up uh, second place in this particular trial. Uh, but it was a tough set of facts. And um, so anyway, our days usually start at eight. Um, the jury would go home at five. We would have you know the mid morning break about. Uh, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. We would have a 45-minute break during lunch, but of course there are usually uh, and a, a time uh, or something that we had to discuss with the judge or we had to take care of in the case over that time period. So I calculated over the three weeks in trial, we went out to lunch once, and that was to Subway. Um, once we went to have lunch and we were immediately called back for a, um, uh, a case. So, no, we did not win. Like I said, we came in second place. It was a marathon. One night we were there till 9 p.m. I literally thought, this is gonna, this is not going to be a problem. I do trials all the time. We'll, we'll, we'll be done by five. Uh, yeah, three weeks. 30-some-odd um, witnesses. Um, one of the attorneys in my office co-counseled, uh, but I did, I think, of the 30-some-odd witnesses, uh, I did all but two. So, Let's just say there was a lot. 
Um, the lovely Miss Kristen had an event uh, for her kid's celebration of turning 21. We were going to go to Vegas. She's like, you're not going. I'm like, oh, I'm going. I'm going. This is No, didn't go. Had too much stuff uh, going on. And then, you know, but just to show you, um, we call it the way it is. Like I said, it was a tough facts, tough, tough facts um, in a case. But, uh, you, you know, you never like seeing your name in the paper when you lose. Okay. Uh, and this was, uh, I guess, actually one of the TV stations in town. But Denver prosecutors anticipate historic human trafficking sentence following conviction. Oh, 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 yeah. Anyway, what they don't tell you is that um, we got some great appellate issues. We anticipated something along those lines in light of the evidence. So, you know, but hey, we we tell it the way it is. You can't win them all. I wish I did. Um, but what can you do? What can you do? It was it was a marathon, ladies and gentlemen. It was a marathon. So, anyway, we're uh, we're back, and uh, I assure you, this is much more fun. So let's get into real quick. Chad Daybell, the jury selection has uh, started. Little monotonous. Um, I think the judge could probably handle it a little differently, but hey, he's the judge. That's why he gets paid the big bucks, and he is doing it the way he wants to do it. They're bringing in a, a, a group of jurors. Um, I'm assuming there's 12 in a group <laughs> uh, since we don't get to see the jurors. And they sit in the jury box. And uh, the prosecution and the defense gets to do kind of a little general voir dire. Uh, they're both kind of pitching their theory of the case. You know, when when's the conspiracy start? When does it end? Uh, are you in for a penny, in for a pound? Hey, who doesn't want to be here? Uh, those general type of questions. And they look for hardships, you know, like, Hey, I just, you know, someone raised their hands. Hey, I can't be out of work, uh, for 10 weeks. I got child care issues. I take care of somebody, etc. Uh, so we got a lot of that. Then we have, um, issues. Then we have issues, uh, regarding bias and, uh, pre-trial publicity. A lot of people are just like, I've read about it. I've watched the documentaries. I have formed an opinion get them out of here. And then the final area that the judge talks to them about uh, individually is the uh, question of whether they could impose the ultimate sentence if there was a conviction, right? It's a death penalty case. The jury decides whether death is warranted. So, um, you know, there were some people that said, you know, I'm generally opposed to the death penalty, but I think I could impose it if it was an option that I had to consider. Needless to say, the defense tried to keep that witness. Uh, the prosecution tried to get rid of that particular witness. The prosecution doesn't want anybody um, on the jury panel that could be sympathetic to some sort of mitigation if it gets ultimately to the uh, uh, sentencing phase. And it's always weird in a death penalty case that they're qualifying the jury for death, which is the sentencing, before the facts have been even heard. Um, so. And, and I've seen cases, uh, Colorado doesn't have the death penalty anymore, but uh, there was a death penalty case. Uh, it was out in Adams County years ago. And um, the judge dismissed a bunch of charges at the halftime at motion for judgment of acquittal. And um, uh, I think ultimately the, the guy was found guilty of second degree murder. Um, so it, uh, you know, sometimes that happens, but normally the prosecution thinks they have a pretty good case. And obviously, uh, during the voir dire process, it's to try and find out who is going to be a fair and impartial jury. Obviously, the prosecution wants to get rid of any potential jurors that they believe are going to be favorable to the defense. Would they say vote for life instead of death? The prosecution, I'm sorry, the defense is obviously trying to get rid of jurors that uh, they believe are going to be favorable to the prosecution and more likely to impose the death penalty if there is, in fact, a conviction. Uh, some of the line of questioning was, you know, if somebody asks, do you believe the death penalty is always warranted if somebody is convicted of first degree murder? And if the people were questioned about that and they said, well, no, I mean, it's certainly an option, but I'm willing to consider it it's based upon the law and the facts of, of each case. And I think most of the jurors were like, well, I support the death penalty. 
but I'm not saying it's appropriate in every case. And that they'd be willing to, you know, they could say yes or no on that. So therefore, those jurors were qualified. Now, a um, couple things that uh, came up, uh, I think it was in today's proceedings, apparently because the prosecution has a bunch of resources, they always do, and they're going through and they're running NCIC reports on every potential juror. And I should probably know what NCIC stands for, uh, but it, it's National Crime. Let's see, uh, uh, does it stand for? <laughs> um, I should probably know that. National Crime Information Center. That's the criminal records database um, that allows criminal agencies uh, to enter or search for information about uh, people that may have a conviction. And so the prosecution has been running an NCIC background check, basically, on every potential juror. I hope none of them have warrants. So anyway, it came out during uh, this process uh, that the uh, uh, prosecution was doing this, and the defense is now going to be provided a copy of the NCIC background check on all of the jurors. Uh, now, normally, let's face it, you don't get the opportunity to run background checks on potential jurors. Usually, the clerk says, here's the list of jurors. The jurors will be in here right, you know, next five minutes, and you're seating a jury, and you'll have a jury seated in the next couple of hours. Very unlikely you have any time whatsoever to do that, but when you get the lists a week before, two weeks before, you can do all the background checking that you want. Now, the prosecutors in their little Vordar spiel, uh, it's all about, you know, um, hey, we can't tell you who uh, actually killed the kids, but this is a conspiracy, so we don't have to. Can you go along with that? Follow the law. She's not wrong. Uh, the whole question then for the defense is, well, what if you didn't know that there was a conspiracy? We're just Chad Day Bell. Doop -de -doop -de -doop, walking along and uh, had no idea what was taking place whatsoever. That is going to be the defense. Mark my words. Now, of course, um, the prosecution jumped up and down when uh, uh, Mark, uh, Mr. Pryor, John Pryor, tried to uh, go into certain issues about conspiracy the other day. And then the prosecution uh, jumps up and, and, and does it themselves uh, today. So, I don't know, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm a little bitter after, you know, being in trial for three weeks, but I just find that kind of stuff just petty. All right. This process could be a little faster. Bring in all 600 jurors, take them down to the local gym or something, have them fill out their questionnaires, tell them when to come back. But you go through all the jurors. Oh, this one says it can't be fair. Poof. Why waste their time? Why waste the court time talking with them individually? Just get rid of them. Right. One of the jurors today was a police officer. I don't never think I've done a jury trial in any jurisdiction where police officers were not automatically excused. Uh, in this particular case, not only was the guy a police officer, he had um, um, uh, worked with one of the investigators or attorneys on the case. Why did the prosecutor not say, hey, judge, um, I've worked with this individual. We move uh to uh, move them for cause. It just wouldn't be fair, but they didn't. And it's stuff like that that just thinks, come on, come on. Did you really think you were going to keep with a police officer who's worked with the people on the prosecution team in the past? Like, why would you even try, right? You got 600 other jurors coming in. Just let it go. So that's the process. It's moving quite slow. The court ended uh, today at 1 p.m. there in Idaho. So that's specific, Pacific, Pacific time. Easy for me to say. And then they were going to meet at 2, the attorneys and uh, the judge, Judge Boyce, to go over uh, more juror questionnaires. Okay, why don't you just strike the people that can't be fair and impartial? Now, what they're doing is they got to get down to the 12 jurors plus six alternates. And so they have to have enough people that are qualified to meet all the general qualifications that can be fair and impartial, reserve judgment till they hear all the evidence, follow the court's instructions, and be willing to impose the death penalty if 
the circumstances warrant that. So roughly, we were doing the math a little bit earlier. You need at least 18 jurors, 12 plus the six. Um, I think what I was calculating was they would get, um, uh, you get seven peremptories plus another uh, peremptory for each alternate. So that'd be 13. And so if everybody exercised all those, I came up with 44, but I think they were talking about getting to 50 jurors. So what they'll do is they'll have those 50 jurors and say, these are our prospective jurors. Then they'll do another kind of general voir dire with them. Then they'll do peremptory challenges. Peremptory challenges you can use on anyone for any reason, unless, of course, you're the prosecution. Then you can't get rid of somebody for a race-based issue. Not really at issue here because, well, um, Chad Daybell is about as uh, the big as a uh, white guy as you can possibly um, come up with. So that won't be an issue. It's going to be simply who do they like? Who do they think is going to give them a fair shake indeed? So there you go. Um, I just thought to myself, uh, I forgot to welcome everybody. We're not only here on uh, YouTube this evening, we're on Twitch, Facebook, Rumble, and X. We're practically everywhere. The, the, the Crime Talk Network is everywhere. Oh, and aren't we on Roku too, Frank? Uh, yeah. Ah, Roku as well. Yeah. Roku as well. And what? No, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I was talking to Frank, the hardest working man in show business, sitting behind the uh, screen back there. And he's got more screens than you could possibly imagine in front of uh, himself, uh, keeping everything running. And we also have a special guest in the house tonight. That's right. We have uh, the lovely Miss Kristen and Miss Winnie the Bulldog. They arrived. Um, it's taken them a little while uh, <laughs> to come back <laughs> because one time Winnie was squeaking her ball and I was like, could you take her outside? And well, anyway, let's just say Winnie is much, much better behaved. Um, and we didn't kick them out regardless of what they uh, think. We didn't kick them out. They've always been welcome. Uh, they could come back anytime. All right. So that's the uh, Chad DeBell matter. Uh, let's talk about Brian Koberger really quick, and then we'll get to the questions tonight. All right, everybody. Um, and uh, hey, Frank, I see Uncivil Law. If he's still here, is he still here? Do you want to send him a link, see if he wants to join us real quick? And see, I think he's following um, the other case as well. Uh, let's see here. Anyway. All right, so let's talk about this Brian Koberger thing, okay? This is just, I think it's petty, petty, petty. This is like the pettiness in the Richard Allen case in Indiana where the prosecutor is trying to have contempt issues as it relates to the defense because somebody came in without permission of the attorney's took some photographs of some things that they shouldn't have taken some photographs of. And the uh, attorneys uh, for the prosecution want to hold them in contempt. And of course, Judge Francis C. Gull wants to hold them in contempt as well. Frankly, I think it's petty that the prosecution even wants to go forward with that now. Do it at the end of the case. But, you know, that's sometimes what petty prosecutors do. They do petty, petty things. So, Brian Koberger's case, does it rise to the level of pettiness? Um, perhaps, okay? So let me give the background a little bit, okay? As you all know, Brian Koberger is charged with four counts of murder and one count of burglary. The state of Idaho has, has given uh, notice that they are seeking the death penalty uh, for Brian Koberger, as you know, that seems reasonable, right? Uh, you allegedly commit four cold-blooded murders. You're kind of getting into that whole death penalty zone if your state still has the death penalty. Seems kind of straightforward to, to me. Some people took offense when I said the defense was just doing what they're supposed to be doing. So anyway, the defense says 
at some point and they filed a motion to change venue. And there's a motion hearing that's going to be set in the future as it relates to change of venue. Now, we've talked about change of venue on um, uh, this, this channel many, many times, okay? And normally a change of venue, I mean, it's one of the first things the client will say is, well, uh, we need a change of venue. Well, no, no, no. The, the, the crime needs to be prosecuted in the jurisdiction and where it is. Well, I'm not going to get a fair trial here. Well, yes, you are. I guarantee you, big jurisdiction, nobody knows what your case is about. Now, then you go to a smaller jurisdiction, and then it gets a little more reasonable as to whether there's going to be a change of venue. But 99% of the time, the judge is like, well, that's really interesting. But let's go through voir dire and let's see if we can seat a jury. And if we can seat the jury, no problem, right? Small town, everybody knows everybody. Um, everybody's familiar with the facts, right? The question is, can they uh, listen to the evidence, withhold judgment until they hear all the evidence in the case, and then follow the law, right? Just because you are familiar with the facts of the case doesn't disqualify you. It's only if you've formed an opinion as to the defendant's guilt. All right. So normally that's what takes place. Um, like I said, I think in my nearly 30 years of practicing law, one change of venue trial was ever granted. It started, started off in Telluride, uh, but it was in the same judicial district, uh, what they call Montrose. And it was um, a double dead baby case. And, uh, <laughs> You know, we, I remember we were out there. I mean, we were extended period of time. And uh, I remember the associate that was doing the case with me at the time, we're out there having having dinner. I'm like, hey, just anecdotally, let's let's uh, let's ask the, you know, waiter, what, 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 did, what do you think? Or the waitress? She's like, oh, yeah, everybody talks about that case. It's the only thing the local uh, uh, radio station covers. And everybody listens to that radio station. Oh, that guy's so guilty. They're all guilty. There were like five people charged. And um, like, ooh, okay, well, that's good. That's good. And, you know, same thing. I remember we we're flying Crime Talk 1 out of the Telluride Airport. Got some great video of that, I might add, too. And um, same thing. Ask them, hey, just anecdotally, um, you know, they're, they're asking, like, hey, how long are you going to be in town? I'm like, oh, I'll be back quite a bit. Kind of a big thing going on here. And um, I said, just, hey, just out of curiosity, have you heard of this case? And they're like, oh, my God, yes, the Norwood murders. Oh, my God, yes, yes, yes. Terrible. They're all guilty. Something I, I got a pretty good motion for change of venue. I mean, it's anecdotal, but yeah, I mean, not scientific. Filed the motion, and then the judge was like, oh, we're moving it on her own motion. And uh, we went, then went to uh, Montrose uh, County, brought in like 600 jurors. I mean, it was huge. Uh, and we found qualified jurors where they probably found my client guilty. Um, <laughs> um, you know, rule of thumb, I guess, if uh, there's going to be two dead uh, people on a, a piece of property where you are not necessarily um, near those children, you're on the other part of the property, close enough uh, for government's work. Dead, you have dead kids, somebody's got to go to prison. But um, hey, what can you do? That's why we have trials, right? Anyhow, so in this particular case, normally, if you want to do a change of venue, you have to have some sort of data, some empirical data that explains why the defendant cannot receive a fair trial because of news publicity. So I think the defense motion, we can go through it, but the defense, the prosecution was like, we got a call from somebody who called the police that got a, a, a phone call asking about the facts of the case. And there were things that she didn't know about. So she contacted the police because we thought that was a violation of the gag order. <gasps> oh my God. Right. So you got some Karen out there. That's, oh my God. This is... So of course the prosecutors are like, Oh my God, they're obviously trying to taint the jury pool by sending robocalls. Like it's a, like an election phone call or something ridiculous. But then, of course, the police have to investigate. So they turn it over to the, the sheriff's office and they find two more people that have been contacted. <gasps> oh, my God. Right. A lot of people got upset with me last week when I was like, 
the defense was doing what they're entitled to. People are like, oh my God, Scott, they're tainting the jury. You don't know what you're talking about. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, you're right. You're, I'm wrong. Whatever. You got your opinion. Let me know how many change of venue cases you've ever tried, right? Um, we'll see, right? So the prosecution files their motion saying, oh, my God, this is terrible. Uh, stop him, judge. Stop him. The judge doesn't know what the heck's going on, puts the ga- puts a, a kibosh to it, says, everybody stop. We'll have a hearing on this. The um, prosecution uh, then says, whoa, judge, you can't do this. You're violating my client's uh, constitutional right um, to a fair trial. You're violating his due process rights. You can't do this without first holding a hearing. Then, you know, the defense um, files some stuff. The prosecution takes umbrage with with the uh, recitation of the, of the case because they reached out and they contacted the lead counsel for Mr. Coburg. And she's like, yeah, I'll be more than happy to sit down with you when I'm in town, uh, you know, next week. What, what's the problem? She's like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. We've done this before on death penalty cases. Never been a problem until the prosecutor, who really, really wants to keep this case in Latah County, doesn't want to move it. Why? Because it's expensive. And what do we know, ladies and gentlemen? It's always about the money, right? So prosecutor files his motion. Judge sets it for a hearing. I believe it's actually set for the fourth um, let's let me just double check that so that I don't misspeak. Yep. Oh, I, uh, no, that's, there's one on May 14th, but I think there was another one coming up. Oh, uh, here it is. Let me just double check. April 4th at one thirty. So Thursday afternoon, one thirty. the defense has made arrangements to have their expert witness, Brian Edelman, Dr. Brian Edelman, PhD, um, and he is their expert witness, and he is going to be called in regards to the jury survey that was being conducted in support of the defense motion to change venue. And so the expert witness is going to explain to the judge and apparently to the prosecutor as well, explain to them the survey process, the content of the survey questions the size of the survey, and the impact on the halted work. Now, I do believe, if I had to look into the Magic 8-Ball crystal ball here, I do believe that the court is going to say, oops, I guess we got it wrong. Sorry about that. Now, if I was the defense, and if this has screwed up the timeline or budget for the public defender, I would ask for sanctions against the prosecutor. Because they're being petty, okay? And I've tried to be pretty darn fair to everybody. I've called out the defense in the Koberger case. I thought the prosecution, you know, I hate to say it, small town. They don't have the resources. All this stuff should have been turned over years ago. We were in the first case, first come. And they're still uh, turning stuff over because they can't get around to it quick enough. So, like I said, there's a hearing uh, coming up for that April 4th. So this Thursday afternoon and um, the uh, prosecution, or I'm sorry, the defense, um, I thought was pretty good. It says the state's objection and declaration of defendant's motion to rescind the order of the court filed on March 22nd confirms that new by March 8th of the survey, the state knew by March 11th, the survey was being conducted by a legitimate company. By March 21st, 2024, the defense had explained basis and validity of the survey. Yet Friday afternoon, the state filed a motion alleging violation of the revised non-dissemination order. This was the first mention the state made of such an allegation. The afternoon filing on March 22nd, 2024, was done with the intention of obtaining an immediate order without a hearing. Of note, due to the bias and interconnectivity in Latah County, Citizens called police and the prosecutors about the survey. The ability of a prosecutor to have an order signed by a judge within the same building within a few hours of the filing and a specific fear the defense had articulated to the state during the March 2021-24 hearing 
is evidence of the state's intention to facilitate a due process violation. The Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 13 of the Idaho State Constitution, protects Mr. Koberger's rights. He is entitled to meaningful notice and a meaningful opportunity to be heard. That, that did not happen. The state points to the court to state v. head for the proposition that since Mr. Koberger had received a copy of the state's pleading and responded with an objection and a request to provide further briefing to the court, Mr. Koberger received due process. In head, the case, the uh, defendant was given multiple hearings and a 90 days to respond to the civil proceedings. Reference to head illustrates the significance of the constitutional deprivation of Mr. Koberger. Even more significant is the case of Nye v. Castellometes, K-A-T-S-I-L-O-M-E-T-E-S, -E -E a 2019 case. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment prohibits deprivation of life, liberty, or property without fundamental fairness through governmental conduct that offends the community's sense of justice, decency, and fair play. Procedural due process is the aspect of due process relating to the minimal requirements of notice and a hearing. It is the deprivation of significant life, liberty, or property interest may occur. Mr. Koberger's life and liberty are at stake. This is a capital case, and he's entitled to be heard on motions pending before this court. Halting preparations for this motion for change of venue denies his constitutional right to a fair trial. The survey work is complete for Latah County, and it shows that the jury pool in Latah County is biased. The state's action that resulted in the secession of the survey prevents other county comparisons. The order should be reversed now and in the future, and no court order should be entered without procedural due process unless the parties so stipulate. And I've taken a couple of whacks at Miss Taylor, the lead attorney for Brian Koberger. She is totally right. Once again, small town politics, small town judicial system. Everybody's in the same building. Yeah, on Friday afternoon, I'm going to go file an ex parte motion saying you're going to serve it via the electronic service. And yet the judge signs it without any further investigation or word from the defense. He goes ahead and signs it. Unbelievable, unbelievable to me. And then the court says, well, I'll just stop it. Nobody does anything else. This is legitimate stuff. This doctor that is going to be uh, testifying, he is a um, PhD. And um, let's just take a look at his uh, curriculum vitae, right? Because nobody has resumes anymore. It's curriculum vitae. Um, I am Brian Edelman. Solely, sincerely, and truly declare as follows. I am the co-founder of Trial Innovations, a national full-service jury research forum. I have worked as a trial consultant for 20 years and have conducted pre-trial and post-trial research on both criminal and civil cases across the country. I have been retained as an expert in over 70 high-profile cases to assess the impact of pre-trial publicity on the fairness of trial proceedings, including the state of Idaho versus Jonathan Renfro, state of Idaho, Gilbert Rodriguez, state of Idaho versus James Holmes, state of Idaho versus Robert Bowers, state of Florida versus Nicholas Cruz, and United States v. David DePepe. Uh, counsel for the defendant and Koberger retained me to research and evaluate whether there was extensive and prejudicial pretrial publicity surrounding the killing of four students attending the University of Idaho in Moscow. The community panic that ensued, the search for the suspect, which ended with Brian Koberger's arrest. Two, to determine if the media coverage has impacted the defense's ability to obtain a fair and impartial jury in Latah County. Three, whether community residents in alternate venues exhibited similar bias, and four, based on the findings, recommend appropriate remedial measures, for example, a change of venue to protect Mr. Koberger's ability to be tried by a fair and impartial jury. As a part of my analysis, I evaluated relevant newsprint, television, and social media coverage surrounding these events and conducted a community attitude survey of 400 residents in Latah County. Comparison survey in the alternative venues have yet to be completed. 
These surveys were designed to assess, assess case recognition, familiarity with prejudicial media content, and bias. It goes on here about uh, his qualifications. He's received his uh, master's and PhD in social psychology from the University of Nevada, Reno, and an LLM from the University of Kent in the United Kingdom. Uh, graduate studies provided me with a broad foundation of uh, qualitative and quantitative research methodologies and statistics. Uh, it goes into the uh, research experience that he has, the jury research experience, the venue experience that he has, his uh, um, expert witness, and the influence of attitude of cognition. Pre-trial publicity, he states, can have a prejudicial effect on jurors through its impact on the formation of attitudes and belief that they bring into the courtroom. Attitudes are not isolated entities, but are often linked to other memories, experiences, attitudes, and beliefs. And these links are a, can create large networks of attitudes which are resistant to change. The links between attitudes strengthen with repeated activation. As these links strengthen, the probability increase that the attitudes and underlying beliefs will be consistent with one another and brought to awareness simultaneously. Attitudes are strongly linked to one another and more easily accessible in memory and more likable to be automatically activated with exposure with the attitude object. It goes on. It talks about the body of research within the social science that attempts to address the impact of pretrial publicity on decision making in the courtroom. And the literature suggests that pretrial publicity influences evaluations of the defendants, of the defendant, perceptions of criminality, sympathy toward the defendant, pretrial judgments uh, regarding guilt, and final verdicts. And then he cites his sources and goes on and on and on. The telephone survey at issue. The survey of 400 residents was conducted in Lataw County. The sample size of 400 was calculated via a power analysis to receive to reach an industry standard 95% confidence interval of plus or minus 5% using the most conservative response distribution, 50%. Comparison surveys were planned in two alternate counties to assess if potential bias found in Latok County carried over to the rest of the state. The survey instrument used in this case adheres to industry standards established by the American Association of Public Opinion Research and the Change of Venue Survey Professional Code established by the American Society of Trial Consultants. The survey instrument, topics of focus, and questions were constructed after reading more than 269 articles that referenced the murder in the Moscow Pullman Daily News, the Idaho Argonaut, and the Spokes Spokesman Review. Steps were taken regarding the structure and flow of the instruments and design of the question to mitigate potential threats to internal validity, including response bias and order effects. All of the questions in the survey instrument, including the media recognition items criticized by the government, were carefully selected based on how pervasive each item was in the coverage. None of the media recognition items included any information that was not widely reported and available in the public domain. Why is that significant? Because they were all in a tizzy because the person that got the call heard some information they hadn't heard before, even though it was already in the public information. So unbelievable. The survey was conducted, a consumer public opinion, uh, business to business market research. They've been in business for some 36 years. Um, they've done it in 49 states. Uh, the screener of the survey, etc. Respondents who refused to participate in the survey were not called again. Uh, to sex successfully win a change of venue, the defendant needs to demonstrate that media coverage has generated bias in the community that undermines his or her constitutional rights to a fair trial. The standard method of measuring pre-judgment and fixed opinions within a venue is a community attitude survey. And they go on to basically say that they have done everything they did. They include a copy of his CV and there you go. Okay. The prosecutors in the Brian Koberger case need to put on the big boy pants, just like the prosecutors do in Indiana and focus on trying your case. 
I hope when this hearing goes on, on Thursday afternoon, and they will more than likely call this um, expert witness, whatever his name was again, I'm sorry, I forgot his name already, but uh, Dr. Brian Edelman, to go through what I just read you. And I hope the court says, you know what, boy, you know, I was, I was wrong. I shouldn't be granting ex parte motions, delaying these proceedings because I got an overzealous Namby Pamby little prosecutor over there who apparently takes his investigative leads from a bunch of Karens that are concerned that they got a phone call on a survey and the prosecutor should know what they were doing. The defense attorneys explained to them what they were doing, and yet they did it anyway. That, ladies and gentlemen, is amateur hour at the Latah County Prosecutor's Office. Can't say anything more about it. Go focus on getting your witnesses and your trial ready, Mr. Prosecutor. They're doing what they need to do. And everybody got all pissed at me last week when I said, the defense is doing what they're supposed to do. I don't know what the big deal is. Okay. I'm telling you, this is what they were supposed to do. How do you think they do it? You think the defense attorneys do anecdotal? Well, like me, I, well, judge, I, I talked to people at the FBO and I talked to somebody at the restaurant and they were both rather convinced that my client was guilty. That's total anecdotal nonsense, right? That's why they call it anecdotal. It doesn't mean anything. They, they need to, it's an example, but it doesn't necessarily show that it is part of the bigger picture. So you have to present analysis. You have to present, oh, what do they call that? Oh, science? Oh, jeez. Oh, yeah, you have to say, let's, let's make sure the questions are okay. Let's call the number of people so that we can get within this accuracy rate. And then you got the prosecutors that go and do this. Go focus on your case, right? You think Brian Koberger is... Um, guilty of committing burglary and four premeditated murders. You know what the prosecutor should be saying? I don't care where you send this trial judge. Certainly we would like to keep it here in Lata County, but if you send it over to Ada County, the big one with Boise in it, right? Um, as we've learned from Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, I don't care where you send me judge. I, my evidence is so overwhelming uh, Mr. Koberger's guilt, I'll take it. You just give me 12 people, and that's it. And um, that's what a good prosecutor should be saying. But instead of saying, you know, like I, I've told this story before. I've told it probably too many times. All our regular uh, people will probably have heard this before. Young prosecutor, right? I'm in, I'm in the military. And... Um, in the military, you know, it's kind of like you have to, the defense has to request stuff uh, from the prosecution. Like, hey, can I please have this? Can I please have this? Blah, blah, blah. Can I go interview this witness? It's going to cost you money, but it comes out of your budget, blah, blah, blah. Young prosecutor, like, oh, we don't need to give that. Well, you know, thinking, you know, we're not going to throw them that. We're, we're going to play games. And my boss at the time, a great, a very good man, good man, he says, you know what? No, we don't play games like that. We're going to give them whatever they want, and we're still going to convict their client because we don't go around charging innocent people. We think he's guilty. We believe our evidence is overwhelming to prove our case beyond a reasonable doubt, and that is what we are going to do. Okay? And in all, in all due respect, running off saying, oh, my God, you're doing this, that sounds like something the defense does to create little red herrings and create issues where, um, hey, if they're working on that, they're not working on preparing their case. Now you got the prosecutor not working on their case, and then the defense is still moving forward. So it just shows how petty, petty it truly is. Um, so I know some people didn't like that opinion. Wouldn't be the first time that we've upset people. But, hey, we are here to call Balls and strikes. If the prosecution does a good job, we're going to call them out on it. If they do a bad job, we're going to call them out on it. 
And same thing with the defense. Um, you know, some of the stuff the defense has been trying to do to do the whole grand jury stuff. I don't, I don't get it. I think it's a waste of time. Um, and everybody said it is, uh, such a waste of time. So I just don't see it as a, um, you know, we'll just call balls and strikes, you know, right now uh, they're a couple years into this thing. Let's, uh, focus on trial. Let's get a date set. Even if it's in 2025, which is, I mean, we're already in April, ladies and gentlemen, April <laughs> set, set a date, February 1st. I don't know if that's a weekday, you know, the first, first, uh, uh, first full work day in uh, February, set it for 10 week trial. Everybody better be ready. That's what the judge needs to do in the Brian Koberger case and stop dealing with this petty stuff. And, you know, stuff like this, Mr. Prosecutor, your job is to protect the record. You look like a little biatch. That's what it comes across as. Really, it does. Um, petty, petty, petty stuff. <sighs> all right. Well, I'm glad I got that off my chest. Um, all right. Enough about me. Let's talk about you all for a while. Um, let's see. Let's see some questions. Frank, were you able to uh, see if Uncivil Law wanted to join us really quickly? Uncivil Law, check your email, man. I saw you on, on your chat and... Uh, uh, it's been a while since we chatted. I, I tuned into you one day. It was great. I saw that you were over a hundred thousand subs too. So good for you. Congratulations. Um, all right, let's take a look at some of the questions here. Uh, judge, let's see here. Judge judge said right out of his own mouth. I don't want to travel for this trial. Oh, okay. Your honor. That's more important than a fair trial. Yeah. Um, judge, judge, you, you can't ignore the scientific data, right? And, um, you know, wait till you, okay, judge, you don't want to grant that motion or you're going to deny it without prejudice so the defense can renew it when we do voir dire and we shut the entire town down and um, you find that you cannot get a fair and impartial jury. There you go. Do you think Judge Boyce wanted to travel from the eastern part of Idaho to the western part of Idaho so that he could do two trials? No, I don't think he did. It was an inconvenience and a great expense to everybody. But he did that to assure that the defense got a fair trial. And we saw Lori Vallow was properly convicted after a fair trial. And there you go. I mean, I think there's a couple of issues on appeal, but we're not going to get into that tonight. All right. But uh, for the most part, it was a pretty fair trial. All right. So uh, just remember that. Um, judge, just do it. And like I said, it's just petty, 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 petty. Um, let's see here. Man, not a whole lot of comments tonight. Uh, uh, if you've never lost a case, you haven't tried many, speaking as a 30-year attorney. Oh, I've lost lots of cases. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I win. I'm on kind of a losing streak right now. You know, it's like, a, uh, Your Honor, I'd like to buy a good fact for 100, please. Oh, sorry. You get no good facts. But an unreasonable client, and we're going to go to trial, Mr. Reich. Congratulations. Have a seat. Let's go. That's what I've gotten lately. All right. Um, yes. Uh, if you've met eight N I N eight. Um, uh, da, 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 I don't not familiar with eight, eight N one N eight. Um, but uh, anyway, yes, I have, uh, I have lost a, a, uh, a bunch of trials over the years and, um, uh, they've been some doozies, been some doozies, um, big, big numbers type cases. But oftentimes, particularly in my younger days, I would get the guy, I would be, get the call from the judge saying, I'm going to point you to this case. Cause I know it can get done. Um, cause either a, you can get along with the client or B if not, you know, either way, we're going to go get this 
case tried because it needs to be tried. So yeah, no, I've I've lost. Um, yeah, the, the people that said they never won it, never lost a case. But really, I mean, maybe a civil guy, you know that. I, yeah, if you're not a real criminal defense lawyer, if you haven't lost cases, okay, all the odds are stacked against you. That's what makes it all the more challenging, right? And then, even when you know as a rational individual, you're thinking, "There's no way this case should be going to trial." Uh, but you know, the, the offer or was unreasonable, or the client doesn't want to accept it, and. Um, Next thing you know, you're going to trial and then you get into trial psychosis. All right. Where literally you're thinking, okay, all they've got is 10 witnesses that saw the entire event take went down. It's on video. They've got a confession and they've got DNA. And what you're thinking is, is so what you're telling me is there's a chance, right? That's how you have to go into trial. You're in that trial psychosis mode. You have checked yourself into the penthouse suite of the psychosis hotel um, to make sure that you are ready to go. Because if a jury doesn't think that you're believing what you're selling, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, they're not going to buy it. Um, so there you go. <laughs> um <laughs> let's see um did p diddy uh didn't didn't he call you scott mm, no but p diddy have some recent experience in some human trafficking cases call me <laughs> sounds expensive uh so yeah there you go it's gonna be uh very expensive um Chris H always like a, a nice little comment there. Don't don't we like that? Uh, Scott's good to hear you again. My wife and I love your live streams. I'm sorry it's been so long. Me too. Like I said, I really thought I was going to do that. I, I, I look over here and I see the lovely Miss Kristen, and um, and even Frank. Didn't I say Frank? Oh, I got this. I'll I'll, I'll I'll just do a live stream from home or something. It'll be a no. I'll do a daily show. What's the problem? It's not going to be a problem. I don't know. When was the earliest I, I ever got home? The lovely Miss Kristen? I don't know. It seemed like maybe eight. Eight was an early night, um, which is not, you know, that's not bad. But it, when you've been literally awake since 4.30, didn't sleep, in court all day, no sleep, no food. Yeah, you become not a very fun person. <laughs> not fun at all. Um, I would come to the office on the weekends to, uh, you know, check the mail and, and things like that. Uh, the classic question, peeps, Scott, do you defend clients you believe are guilty? I know you may find this hard to believe, but I have even won clients trials where I thought they were guilty. Yes, that's my job as a criminal defense attorney, right? It's not about whether you think the client is guilty or not, it is only whether the prosecution can prove the elements of the case. Remember, when they say, oh, the defense won, what they really should be saying is the prosecution failed. They failed to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. That is what it boils down to. It wasn't some loophole, all right? The Constitution of the United States of America is not a loophole. Okay, a fair trial, a right to a jury trial, due process of law is not a loophole. It simply is not. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that doesn't mean that he, let's see here. Uh, thanks for the, the question, Pete. Yes, I mean, I'm a criminal defense attorney. You think I ever had clients um, walk in and say, hey, you know, I've done it. I did it. Everything they say in there is true. Get me a reasonable offer or we're just going to go to trial. Okay. And you go try the case. Your client can come in and tell you that. You're absolutely, I did it 100%. It's on video. They got 10 witnesses. And 
the defendant has an absolute right to make the prosecution prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. I remember I had a case years ago. We, we, we even to this day, the uh, prosecutor uh, who is now a judge, uh, we still we still uh, joke about it. Um, client goes, robs um, a bunch of people. I think they were standing in like a 7-Eleven line. They're all standing in line to pay for their, you know, bottles of Coke or whatever they got from the refrigerator or their M&Ms. And Lydia goes in and robs each and every one of them. Right. So it's like, take that guy's Coke bottle, take his five bucks, 10 to 32, 10 to 32, 10 to 32, 10 to 32. Then travels down the road and uh, goes into a, a grocery store and um, tries to grab something and uh, pulls a gun and uh, shoots a, a um, security guard, an armed security guard there. And it's on video. It's on video. And my clients, you know, it's just like, man, it, that ain't me. That ain't me. And you're like, um, okay, well, I'm your attorney. I'm going to do everything I can for you. But I want to tell you something. I'm telling you, I think that kind of looks like you. I think a reasonable jury would say, that looks like you. That ain't me, man. That ain't me. Okay. So, you know, I try to get, you know, creative and take a picture to mom. Say, hey, is this your baby? She's like, that ain't my baby. That ain't my baby. I know my baby, and that ain't my baby. And um, so it's on video one and not so good on the other. And, you know, I'm like, oh, they put the, they, they didn't even get the, the fingerprints or they didn't get the DNA uh, off the bottle to say it was my guy. You can't believe anything. Oh my gosh. They didn't fail to prove their case. And first I remember the, um, prosecutor gets up and says, you know what DNA stands for? Don't need any. <laughs> I just got to smile. Like that was good. That was good. Um, <laughs> that was in his, uh, uh, clothes there, uh, his second clothes. And I was like, that was good. And even to this day, even to this day, we still chuckle about that because it was such a, a classic moment. And um, I ultimately, you know, I had to put my client's mom on the stand and I got, ma'am, I want to show you this picture. Take a look at defense exhibit A. This has previously been admitted into evidence. Will you take a look at that photo, ma'am? And will you tell me if, if that's your baby? Mom looks at a photo. Oh, my God. That ain't my baby. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you can't believe a mom to say that ain't her baby, who can you believe? You know who they did believe? The man that got shot uh, through his spine and was a paraplegic. Right, I swear to God, this uh, this this trial, uh, the DA and the judge who since retired, but I saw him once, still remembers this case. All right, and then and then then we're gonna have to end. But I'm telling you, this this was this case. It, it was it was just it had classic moments. So they bring in the guy that gets shot. He's you know shot through the spine or something, but he's in a wheelchair, right? And he's in one of those big wheelchairs that has like the really high back because I think he can't move anything. He can like move his finger, right? And he comes in with his little little chair and he moves the chair with his little finger. And he comes into court, turns around to the jury, right? Looks at him. Prosecutor asks him some questions. You know, let's talk about the day in question. Yeah, what happened? With Zoom? And I got shot. They had never done, they had never done a photo array of this guy beforehand, right? To see if he could pick out, you know, the defendant, my client. And so the judge, or I'm sorry, the prosecutor goes, Mr. Victim, will you please take a look around this room and see if you see the man who shot you? 
so he's sitting there in his high wheelchair because he's paraplegic. And, you know, I, I mean, at least he can use his finger, right? So he's kind of sitting here. The love of Miss Kristen is like, oh, my God. What, this is how you got to tell the story. All right. This is how you got to tell the story. So he's sitting there in his chair. And the guy's never really looked over to the defense table. So I'm like, okay, this is good, right? Okay. He hasn't, didn't look at my guy and like, oh, there he is, right? So he looks. And first he kind of moves his wheelchair around. And he looks over. And he looks at the court staff. And he focuses on them. Looks to the jury. I'm like, oh, my God. He's going to pick a juror. Like, this is great. And all of a sudden he goes, and he looks again at the jurors. And I'm like, he's going to pick a juror. <laughs> and then he goes, and he looks over to the prosecution table. And I'm thinking, he's going to pick a prosecutor. This is fabulous. Then all of a sudden he goes, and he looks right at the defense table. And with his one little finger, he points and says, that's the man that shot me. And of course, my client then jumps up and said, I didn't shoot you. It's not me. <laughs> so we had the DNA. Don't need any. That ain't my baby. We got the guy in the wheelchair with the finger. That's the man who shot me, right? I'm with my client jumping up, and I'm like, oh, sit out. Oh, don't do that. Oh, don't cause a mistrial. No, don't do that. <laughs> anyway, the jury of his peers promptly, uh, promptly found him guilty. <laughs> and um, yes, so lovely Miss Kristen is over here dying a thousand deaths. I cannot believe you're telling this story. I mean, but the guy came in a wheelchair. I'm not being mean. I'm just, that's the way it was. And that's the way it was like in there. And you're just like, he's going to pick it out. I mean, he literally like stares at the juror. Like he's going to, I'm like, he's going to pick a juror. This is fabulous. This is, we're going to win this thing. I think he's going to pick a prosecutor. And then he gets there and he's just that little finger. That's the man that shot me. Ugh. I think that client got 169 years or something. I mean, as a as a as a young attorney, uh, that was uh, <laughs> um, that that was uh, 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 it was just devastating. <laughs> like, what else could I have done? But there wasn't anything, you know. Uh, so right, no, I think it was. I think he turned down 60 years. That was it. I think he turned. Down, yeah, it was like 160. I mean, he got a, a stack of money. Anyway, um, so that was it. All right, Super Chat. Let's see here. Let's Super Chat. Obviously, we don't beg for Super Chats, but um, we certainly appreciate them. Clumsy Clairvoyance. Are you going to go to the Delphi trial? That would be great. Um, I would like to. And um, I have to do my, recur I think his trial's in May, right? Is that right, Frank? May 17th? May 15th, I think. Anyway, I, I got to do a recurrency training um, for uh, Crime Talk 1 at some point in May. Um, so I did it last time in Indiana. So maybe I can go to Indiana. I don't know. Maybe I can get it done early. But either way, we would like to do that. Additionally, um, we flew out last year to the Lori Vallow trial. Um, in fact, I still have my little ticket here. Hey, what was that? What was that museum you went to in in uh, Nevada with your kids? The lovely Miss Kristen, Baggins. Zach Baggins. Do you think he would buy this ticket as a uh, memorabilia? My admittance into the Lori Vallow trial overflow room. Take a look at that, ladies and gentlemen. I wonder if we should put that up on the market. See what that'd be worth. Uh, so the goal is also to try and get out to the uh, Chad Day Bell trial, um, maybe for a day or two. But yeah, I'd like to go to um, Indiana. I would love to see this Francis C. Gull. Um, her parents at least had a sense of humor because apparently she doesn't. And um, I'd like to go out there and I'd like to go um, 
to uh, Ada County there in Idaho. And if Koberger ever gets around to doing anything other than having little hissy fits as it relates to you can't contact the jurors to do what you're supposed to do. Oh, my God. Jeez, what a bunch of little whiners. Bunch of whiners. Jeez. Just go try the case, man. Just go try the case. Don't drag it. Don't play a little nonsense of, well, the prosecution did this and the blah, blah. It's just petty. Everybody's doing their jobs. You have to operate from the assumption that the prosecutors are going to be ethical and the defense counsels are going to be ethical unless and until they prove otherwise. General rule of thumb, I think anybody, any good attorney will tell you this, is what I tell all my attorneys that have ever worked for me, um, even clients. Listen, you're a nice guy, right? But I've never met a client worth going to jail for, and I've never been paid enough money to jeopardize my law license uh, for a client. So no, we're not going to do anything unethical. I will do everything I can to zealously and ethically um, represent you, but I will not break the law and I will not cross ethical bounds to do that. Like I said, you're a nice guy and all, but let's get for real. If things don't go like we all hope they, we hope they're going to go. First thing you're going to do is blame your attorney. Bottom line. So, you know, <laughs> why would I jeopardize my future for this guy that'll throw me under the bus the first time something doesn't go his way? Not going to happen. Okay. Um, it's just the way it is. There's certain clients you don't go and see by yourself, right? You always have a witness, even if it's in your own office, you know, you have bring your paralegal in to take notes of the conversation. So there's never anything uh, that could even be suggested that wasn't above board. Uh, and you always, always, always do confirming letters to uh, memorialize conversations that you've had with clients just the way it is. Hey, and if this doesn't actually reflect what we talked about, let me know immediately. All right. Um, oh, uh, oh, I thank, uh, thank Chris H for a, uh, super chat as well. Not a question, but appreciate you there. Chris H clumbly clairvoyance. And obviously our, uh, uh, mod mama pink appreciate everything you do. Glad to be back after your little, uh, vacation I gave you because I hadn't had, had anything for anybody to do. Uh, Scott makes being a lawyer look fun. Ha. <laughs> uh, some days it's the best job in the world. Other days you think, I don't know, I'm going to go work at Starbucks, man. Why am I doing this? Um, can you do the finger noise no, no, one more time? No. So no. he so he comes in in his little wheelchair. No. We should not be able to make a make a um, a short out of that, don't you think, Frank? Uh, you've got your best. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Uh, you can tell Scott loves being a lawyer most of the time. Yeah. Most of the time, some days, uh, you know, and like I said, I like most of my clients. I really, really do like most of my clients, but every now and then, man, there's one that you're just like, we're, we're done. We can't do this anymore. It's just not worth the brain damage. Uh, let's see. Nate Eaton said there was a bunch of press for, uh, Chad's trial. You couldn't see it in the courtroom. They don't have any overflow rooms. And it looks like basically just the prosecutor, maybe some family members uh, there. There's nobody on Chad's side at all. I don't see a whole lot of press, but it's basically jury selection. Not exactly the most exciting stuff at all. And yes, Chad's lawyers do love to point out that there are four prosecutors. All the resources of the state of Idaho versus my poor little client, Chad Daybell, and me. That's all he's got, ladies and gentlemen. He's going to work it. That's what lawyers do. Don't get upset with him. He's doing, he's working with what he's got. I don't think he has a whole lot of good facts, right? The 
oblivious new boyfriend defense uh, may not carry the day. It may not carry the day. All right. Uh, Mama Pink said it, not me. Judge Gall doesn't want to get caught by the public. She's denied every motion that should have even at least had a hearing. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Allegedly innocent. Let's see here. The prosecutors on the Koberger case are absurd. Let's have the case in the summer because we share a parking lot. Damn. Let's just move the damn trial. Or are you afraid your case is weak to go to the big city? That's what I'm telling you, man. Good prosecutors are going to say, bring it on, judge. You tell me where. You tell me when. I'll bring my witnesses. I'll be ready to go. I'll meet my burden. That's what a good prosecutor does. They don't play little ticky-tack games. Frankly, that's what the defense is supposed to be doing, right? Not the prosecutor. Anyway. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have done our hour or so here. I hope you enjoyed the show. It's our first one back after our little thing. Yes, and Mom Pink is right. Remember, the Constitution matters. Now, and I say that, and sometimes people are like, what is that supposed to mean, Scott? The Constitution matters? Um, it does, ladies and gentlemen. Um it's the rules we have to play by, and you have to do what the rules say. The rules are spelled out. They're clear. They're simple. That's what the rules say you're supposed to do. It's the playbook that everybody's supposed to follow. Um, just like in a sporting game, you have the rules. Somebody's going to push it. Nope, you stepped over the line. You're out of bounds. You can't do that. Um and a lot of times people don't, they just don't care. You know, you see those people on the street interviews where people couldn't tell you one of the, uh, you know, constitutional amendments or, you know, it would be okay if we got rid of uh, freedom of speech. And, and you're just like, are you kidding me, ladies and gentlemen? Unbelievable. The Constitution does matter. Um, and you got to like it all. And if you don't like a particular portion of it, there's a there's a way to change it. Get two thirds of the states uh, to ratify any of the changes. Um, so if you don't like something, go change it. Otherwise, that's the law of the land. You got to figure it out. <laughs> Make sure you've left your DNA on that like button. I like that. Uh, join our Patreon show. Yes, if you have not become a Patreon, uh, we're going to do another show after this. Sometimes it depends. We go 30 minutes. Sometimes we go an hour. Just depends on how many people show up and if uh, it's a good conversation. But it's their show because you're a Patreon. You pay a very small amount of money. I assure you it's not uh, that much. And uh, we send you some free cool stuff if you're becoming a Patreon member. And, of course, you can call in and have a conversation with yours truly instead of me just talking and looking at um, the chats. It's uh, it's always good to hear from our Patreon members. Uh, you're all so smart and um, just love the law as well. Um, anyway, so my son, he, my son is in a forced constitutional class right now. He loves it now, though. Of course he does. Most people, most people have never read the Constitution. It's not that long. Look it up. You could even Google it. Constitution and amendments. Make it read it to you. It's that simple. It's that simple. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We are going to jump over and do our Patreon show here in just a few minutes, we already ate, so we're good to go. So it's going to be a quick turnover here so we can get Frank out of here because he's been sitting behind uh, watching all these uh, trials for the last uh, weeks or so. And um, he probably wants to get home to his uh, wife and kids as well. All right. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you in the Patreon show in just a few minutes. Thanks for joining us. And yes, the Constitution does matter.